Thank you so much. Isn't it good to stop and to um, just forget ourselves for a bit and, um, and focus on God? I'm just going to um, read this passage again because it, it is such an important um, moment in the life of God's people. If you want to read it, it's on page 52 in the New Testament of the Bible, the Bibles in the pews. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Heavenly Father, as we think on these words, we pray that you would open our minds and open our hearts and flood in, flood into our, our hearts and our minds, our souls, our bodies, with your wonderful love. Transform us, change us, help us to see clearly what is true and important in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Aren't you glad that someone asked Jesus this question? I don't know about you, I expect you might be the same as me, but life comes past so fast. And you've got, you know, there's things to do, there's stuff to organise, there's money, there's... Um, there's, there's what am I doing next week. Um, for us, there's children to organise, there's schools, there's work, there's those problems that have been going around my mind for quite a while. There's the rugby to watch, there's the football to keep up with, uh, there's pensions to think about, there's my parents, my sisters I haven't called for a while. I think I'm getting a, a bit fat, so I need to fit in time for some more exercise. I need to eat a bit more healthily. And um, what is the most important thing again? Do you ever have that feeling? Life is just so full. I'm sure it was then, just as it is now. And it is so easy to get lost in life. And so bless him, this man comes up to Jesus, and he's a learned man. He's a scribe, and he walks up to Jesus, and he listens for a bit to the conversations that are going on. Because in a way that we don't really do so much, except perhaps on things like the Alpha Course and the Beer and Philosophy, which we run sometimes in the pub, they love to find spaces where they could talk about the big questions and kind of, you know, discuss and, and um, argue and dispute things. And so he listens to this for a bit, and then he dives in, and he asks the most important person who has ever lived the most important question there is. What matters most? I'm so grateful that he, that he asked this and that we have a record of Jesus' answer. So the most important person who ever lived, Jesus, who's, who's transformed the history of the world more than any other person, is asked the question, what's the most important thing in life? Now imagine if he'd said, discipline. Yeah, or imagine if he'd said, try really hard to be nice all the time. Or imagine if he'd, he'd said something that your hearts would sink. You know, that would be bad news, wouldn't it? Because that would, you know, by his estimation, be the most important thing. But Jesus answers this question. Which commandment is the most important? He answers it with actually what is an ancient prayer. And in one word, the answer is love. Now, I don't know how you respond to that, but I'm like, that's good. That's good news. The most important thing in life is love. I think instinctively we all know that. Is love the only thing that's never gone out of fashion? I think it probably is. It doesn't matter. Every generation loves love, doesn't it? It never becomes old-fashioned. Oh, my parents are into that, but I'm not excited by that at all. Love is something that we all long for, that we're made for. And so Jesus says the most important thing is love. 
And it's to love God and to love other people. The most important thing. Now we, um, as English people, apologies to other nationalities present, as English people, we're immediately at a disadvantage because love means getting a bit enthusiastic. Excited even. Dare I say, giddy. These are words we don't do very well, aren't they? But that's what love is all about. If we love, we get passionate. We get excited. We let what we love take over our lives. John Wesley um, started off life as a vicar in the Church of England, and um, he was kicked out and ended up founding the Methodist Church, and his chief offence was that he was what is called an enthusiast. (laughs) Heaven forbid there are enthusiasts in the Church of England. He was too enthusiastic. People didn't like it. He took it all too far. He was more than just eccentric, and let's face it, that's bad enough if you're English. He was actually properly passionate. And so what happened? He got kicked out of the Church of England. Love means being passionate. It means opening our hearts to something that is bigger than we are. I learned this week about a man called Michael LeCount. I don't suppose any of you know about him. He's he's English, uh, despite having a surname like LeCount. He lives just south of Sheffield, and he is what is known as an AFOL, A-F-O-L. Does anyone know what that means? We might have one or two. I might even be one myself. It means adult fan of Lego. (laughs) Am I the only one? Okay. Anyway, I'm not in Michael's league because Michael has 4,000 different sets of Lego. He has a very understanding wife. I've never met her. I don't even know her name, but I know he has an understanding wife because they have bought the house next to their house in the village where they live, which is a four-bedroom house, and it is entirely devoted to storing his Lego collection. He is, has one of the biggest Lego collections in the world. Now, Michael loves Lego, and it takes over his life. I'm not saying that's what we should all do, but when we love something it does tend to take over, doesn't it? It Maybe it gets a little bit out of hand. Have you ever known um, a teenager who fell in love? And beforehand, they were so busy, you were like, I don't even know how you'd find time to eat one more biscuit in a week. You're doing so many things. And then they fall in love, and suddenly all they do is spend time with or texting or on the phone to the person they've fallen in love with. They seem to have no space in their life at all, but they fall in love, and suddenly they find hours and hours to do seemingly nothing but be with the one they love. That's what love does to us. It makes us enthusiasts, even despite ourselves. We end up buying four-bedroom houses to store all the, the objects of our love. We end up making space in our lives that we didn't think we had. Why? Because of love. Marriage is given to us, not actually primarily to make people happy, If they get married, there are lots of other ways of being happy. Marriage is given to us as a sign of God's love. Because um, in marriage, two people determine to spend the rest of their lives loving each other more and more and more. And in marriage, two people... Marriage is the opposite of parenting. Not like parenting is about hate, but (laughs) parenting... Bear with me, I'm digging myself out of this... Uh, Parenting begins with two people who, in the, in the case of the mother, were physically attached. And parenting is a divergent relationship where, as time goes on, these two people, the child becomes less and less dependent on its parents until, if all goes well, when the parents die first, the child is able to live an adult life. That's what parenting is. Marriage is the opposite. Two people who, once upon a time, had never set eyes on each other, never knew each other, were complete strangers, meet, and because of their love for each other, they get closer and closer and closer together for the whole of their lives. Now, there are lots of other relationships where that can happen too. But marriage is is given, the Bible teaches us, as a sign, a mystery that shows us about God's love. You see, God's plan for our lives is not that we bump into him and then kind of wave and say, how are you? Fine, for the rest of our lives. No, God's plan for our lives is that we would grow closer and closer and closer and closer until in death, Our our, our love with God, if you like, is consummated and we are together all the time for all eternity. See, theologically, I think I've said this before, it's absolutely true to say God wants to marry you. He's seen you 
and his heart has leapt and he just wants to be with you and he wants to get closer to you for the whole of the rest of your life. This is the kind of thing that Jesus is drawing the scribes' attention to. And I believe he wants to draw our attention, especially us here in this 1059 congregation, to this love. Jesus goes back to um, some verses from Deuteronomy. So the quote um, that we heard, the the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That is taken from the book of Deuteronomy. If you want to, you can look at it. It's on page 176, chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. This is the most famous, if you're Jewish, the most famous bit of the Bible. It's like John 3.16, you know, God so loved the world, is the most famous verse for Christians. This, for Jews, would be it. They call it the Shema, and it is a prayer that um, that a, a Jew, if you are, um, you know, a zealous Jew, um, would say this prayer every day of their life. So I'm reading now from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And it goes on to say, um, don't forget these words. Keep remembering them. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you go away, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And if you have any Jewish friends, you'll know that Orthodox Jews do that today, this day. And they have this verse written in Hebrew and in a little box attached to their forehead. And they write it on the doorpost of their house. It is so important. It's the most important thing. And Jesus is basically saying this is true. The most important thing. Love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. Or as the message translation puts it, I love this. Love God with all your passion, with all your prayer, with all your intelligence and with all your energy. You see, God's love is meant to affect every area of our lives, our thinking, the way we feel, the way we perceive what's going on around us, the decisions we make. I'm trying to expand our imaginations of what the love of God in our lives might look like. That we might become so intimate with God that he becomes more and more part of everything. That he moves in to the house of our lives and makes himself at home in every single room even the attic that's a bit messy, or the cellar where we store the stuff we don't want anyone to see. Now, the great news about this is that we don't have to kind of conjure this love up, like squeeze it out, like um, sometimes we're prone to do. Do you ever meet people and you think, I know you're trying to love me, but I can see you're squeezing as hard as you can and there's still not quite enough love coming out. God doesn't want us to live like that. There's a verse in in John's first letter in the New Testament which says, we love God because he first loved us. Now, if you look at a baby, why does a baby love its mother so much? Because every time it looks up, it sees the mother's face beaming love at the child. And so children love their mothers. Why? Because their mothers love them. It's the same with us and God. You know, when we look at God, when we stop as we just did and maybe sing about God, where we, when we stop and think, maybe look at the cross, or we, we think about the story of God, or we think back to our own lives and think, I mean, I think, God, you were there for me when I was totally ignoring you, and your love just never stopped. It's just like this river just flows on and on and on, and the years come and go, but the love just keeps coming. That's why we love God, because he loves us first. Think for a minute, what's the opposite of that kind of love? I think maybe the best word is betrayal. You know, when someone loves another person so much and that person just decides they are not going to return that love at all. In fact, they're going to throw it back in their face. They're going to ignore them. They're going to cut them out of their lives. We see that, don't we, uh, in relationships sometimes. Maybe you yourself know that sense of, of just the, the hurt of love that is not returned. Do you know God feels like that? All the way through the Bible, people who don't respond to God's love are described as spiritual adulterers. You know, God actually minds whether we return his love, just like a mother minds if a child one day says, I don't want you in my life anymore, I'm off. Or if a child says, right, I'm going to see you once every, you know, once a year. 
I might phone every three months. Do you know God minds when we take that attitude to him? He feels hurt. It grieves him. And many of you will know I've just come back from three months um, on sabbatical, so not, not having my kind of normal responsibilities. And one of the main things I've realized in that time is how many other places my heart goes instead of to God. You know, and none of them in themselves are, are, are probably deeply evil, or you might be relieved to hear. But, uh, you know, just stuff that, that actually, what, what do I do when I have time and, and no one's around and nothing happens? I mean, that tells me a lot about myself. What do I turn to? You know, is it, oh, what's happening in the sport? Or, oh, you know, I, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to watch some TV or I'm going to lose myself in that book. And I, and there's nothing wrong with these things. But why doesn't my heart first go, God? You know, why, why do I busy myself? And what, one of the things, I, my work. You know, my job is to help lead this church. But, but I spend so much time thinking through problems and worrying about things and, and so little time going, God, I've got a spare half hour. I can spend it with you. It's a sign that my heart's disordered. And when I just kind of drift up to God when I feel like it, I haven't really understood how much love there is from God. And I certainly am not fulfilling this most important of all the commands, to love God with all my heart. See, do you know anyone who's, or two people who have a relationship, you look at that and you're like, man, that, that is amazing. Just the quality of that love. You thinking of anyone, maybe you've got someone that you, you can think of like that? Well, I can tell you two things without meeting about those people. One, they haven't just met. And two, they don't just send Christmas cards to each other. <laughs> yeah, those people have known each other for a long time and they have invested so much in their relationship in order to become intimate with each other. We have such an impoverished imagination about what life with God should be like. If you think... You know, or, or act, as, as I sometimes do, as if life with God is just about checking in every so often and he'll kind of be there when you really need him. You have got a, a tiny shriveled view of life responding to this commandment. Life with God is meant to be like that relationship you were just thinking of, only much, much better, and you are in it. It's meant to be a lifelong journey of growing intimacy. There is far more there than we ever dream could be there that we can know God so closely, closer than our closest friend, that we can love him with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength. And actually, everything else in life slightly pales in comparison, but gets better at the same time because we've done the most important thing, loving God with all our hearts. I um, had a friend who went to watch a film that came out it's quite a long time ago now called The Passion of the Christ. I don't know if any of you saw it. Mel Gibson was in it. It was a film about um, the last week of Jesus' life and about how he went to the cross and died. It's very graphic. It's very painful watching. Um, I went to watch it. I think Helen and I went to watch it together and, and had the experience that my friend did um, the only time in my life when no one has talked as they've left the cinema. Absolute silence. And my friend and his wife... Um, left the cinema in silence, got into the, walked to the car, didn't speak, drove all the way home without speaking, went and sat in their lounge on the sofa, turned the light on, and just sat there still in silence as they thought about this story of this totally innocent man being betrayed by one of his best friends, given a mockery of a trial, being uh, flogged and tortured without um, speaking back and then was nailed to a cross where he hung in front of all his friends, completely humiliated, until he died. And finally, my friend's wife spoke, and she said, and to think I gave up Diet Coke for Lent. We have no idea how much God loves us, the lengths he goes to for us. We, We have no... I'm standing here, I have no idea... I've just glimpsed the corner of the edge of Jesus' robes. We have no idea how much is there. 
but because we have no imagination of how, how wonderful this could be, we don't really give ourselves to it. No wonder when Jesus is asked, what's the most important thing? He answers, love God. Love him with everything. And I, I'm sure you know, uh, as I know, people who, who really try to do that. Actually, I took a decision quite early on in my Christian life. I heard someone give a talk a little bit like this, actually. And at the end, um, he quoted a, a, a guy called D.L. Moody, who was a, an evangelist in the 19th century in the States. And D.L. Moody had said to him, he'd heard someone say, uh, the world has never seen what God can do with one life completely devoted to him. And D.L. Moody said to himself, uh, I'm going to try and be that person. And he, if you know the story, changed the course of the history of America. And I heard that talk uh, 23 years ago. And I said, do you know what? <laughs> My life's a bit of a mess at the moment. I'm running around like a headless chicken. I'm going to try and do that. And I have tried to do it for the last 23 years. And I, I'm just kind of, you know, I don't know, just out of the starting blocks because there's a long way to go. But I want to put that challenge to us as a church. What if we really took this commandment seriously? What would your life look like if you loved God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength? Now, we can't do it perfectly, but if you're like me, you can have a much better crack at it than you are at the moment. And I want to stand here as your vicar and say, go for it. I promise you, you won't regret it. Whatever you lose, you will gain a hundred times more. It's a promise. We can't outgive God. And so whether you've been trying to give all your life to God for 50, 60 years, or whether you're here this morning, you've never heard about this at all and it's all brand new to you, I want to say, put all your eggs in God's basket. Love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And by the way, that's what means we can love other people too because it just starts to flow out of us. I want to invite us to pray now. So can I ask you to stand, um, if you're happy to? And I'm going to um, read some words from the book of Revelation. So you might want to close your eyes just as you listen to this. You don't have to, but you might like to. And I, I believe, as I've been preparing for today, that this, this is um, something, this is Jesus speaking to a church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. But I believe that he um, is speaking these words to us as a church too. And just like us, this church in Ephesus had been through a really difficult time. And a whole load of people had been taken out by it. And there'd been a lot of pain and difficulty. And if you've been in this church for the last 12 months, you'll know um, that's what we've been going through. And this is what Jesus wrote to that church. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember from the height you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Lord, we are here and we all have some things in common. We have all given you less than you deserve. We have not loved you with all our hearts. And we're so sorry for that. We also have in common that your love 
rolls on and on and never changes. And that love displayed by Jesus laying down his life for us is as strong today as it ever has been or ever will be. Send your spirit, we pray, into our hearts now and help us to return to you, to our first love. Open our eyes to grasp how high and wide and deep and long is your love. Show us that what we thought was a little stream is an ocean. That what we thought it's okay just to, to um, step in and out of is something into which we can dive and swim and live and remain. I want to pray for anyone who... Um, who, like me, has maybe a heightened sense of the, the wrong places or the places that aren't God, that, um, that your heart bends towards like a magnetic force that keeps pulling you to something that you, you see isn't right, isn't, it's, it's become too big in your life. Maybe it's anxieties, maybe it's worries, maybe it's your physical health, maybe it's Scare, uh, being scared about the future. Maybe it's to do with money or relationships. Maybe it's something good, some cause that you have in your life. Maybe a cause that God has given you, but it's just become oversized. It's taking up too much. If that's you, I want to invite you to, um, to just, in the quiet, do business with God and, and say, I want to give this back. I want you to come and fill the space that this was taking in my life. In Romans chapter 5, it describes how um, God pours his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. See, the Spirit is the one who, if if we will give permission, he will come and reveal God's love for us so that we, like that baby gazing up into its mother's face, can, can see what we maybe haven't seen in that way before, the love of God. And Father, I pray now for every person here who, who has an open heart to you, that you would pour out your Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us with love. Help us to see the love of God in the face of Christ. Father, bring us to that place where we can pray with the Apostle Paul. Whatever gains I had, these I count as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him. We're going to sing another song um, now, but I encourage you to stay in an attitude of prayer.